coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. I kept telling the Who's Your Mike story. It was resonating with people. And I realized there's a lot of characters like these that resonate with folks. And so that's why we came up with the archetype version of each character. And Resume Ralph was a, another real example. And, and all these are based on real characters, either that I've experienced directly or that I've worked with. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 167 of Passion Struck, recently ranked by Feedspot as one of the top 50 most inspirational podcasts in the world. And if you're new to the show, welcome. And if you have a friend or family member that you would like to introduce the show to, and thank you so much for doing that, we now have episode starter packs, both on Spotify and on the Passion Struck website. These are collections of our fans' favorite episodes that we organize into topic to give any new listener a great way to get acquainted to everything we do here on the show. Just go to passionstruck.com slash starter packs to get started. In case you missed my episodes from last week, they featured interviews with Gene Oweng, the founding CEO and current president of Virgin Unite, which is the philanthropic arm of the Virgin Companies led by Sir Richard Branson. And we discuss her new book, partnering and how she has discovered how to forge these important relationships that can change the world. And I also interviewed Kara Chamberlain, who survived a kidnapping by a serial killer, and we discuss her harrowing story of survival. And in case you missed my solo episode from last week, it's how do you overcome mediocrity? And I provide 10 different ways that you can do that in your own life. Please check them all out. I also wanted to say thank you so much for your continued support of the show and all your five-star ratings and reviews that go so far in helping the popularity of this show grow. We also love those comments that you give, and I know both myself and our guests love to read them. Now, let's talk about today's guest. Kurt Wilkin is an experienced entrepreneur and founder of Hire Better. In his debut book, Who's Your Mike? A No Bullshit Guide to People That You'll Meet on Your Entrepreneurial Journey, Kurt reveals how entrepreneurs can transform their companies by minimizing hiring mistakes, investing in high potentials, and making the difficult decision to drop dead weight from their team. By putting the right talent in the right places and pinpointing who is holding the company back, entrepreneurs can unlock meaningful change that will enable their organizations to grow, scale, and thrive. And in today's episode, we discuss the lessons that he learned early on while he was working at a big four accounting firm, the steps that he took to become an entrepreneur and scale his first company, the backstory for how he came up with the title for the book and its meaning. We go through several of the avatars that he profiles throughout the book, and these include Resume Ralph, Bouncer on Betty, Side Hustle Sam, and HR Rona. We discuss the importance of company culture to employee engagement, as well as different assessment tools that companies can use to evaluate their employees' engagement and their predictability engaging employees, as well as so much more. Thank you for choosing Passion Struck and choosing me to be your host and guide on your journey to creating an intentional life. Now, let the journey begin. I am so excited to welcome Kurt Wilkin to the Passion Shark Podcast. Welcome, Kurt. Hey, John. Thanks so much for having me. I love what you're doing to make people's lives better and make their businesses better. Well, thank you for that. And speaking of making businesses better, you and I both had a similar early beginning to both our careers. I was in the military, but following that, I worked for Booz Allen, and then I took a job with a big four consulting firm out of Houston called Arthur Anderson. And you yourself were with Ernst & Young when you came out of college yourself. So I wanted to ask, what are some of the biggest lessons that you covered in chapter four about your experience working with the big four? 
First of all, you're our bitter rival, Arthur Anderson, and no longer around. I learned a lot at, at EY. I learned how to work with clients in a professional manner. It also gave me so much credibility for my own career to have the words Ernst & Young behind my name and CPA behind my name. I went to the University of Arkansas, so uh, I don't get a lot of respect when it comes to colleges. But now that once I added CPA and EY to my name, it gave me credibility. But I learned how to conduct myself in a professional manner, and I learned how to serve clients really benefited me tremendously throughout my career. What I didn't learn was how to be an entrepreneur. And I know we'll we'll probably get to that a little bit later too. Yes. Well, it sounded like there was overlap or close overlap between the time that I was working in Austin with Arthur Anderson. And when you were leaving Ernst & Young to kind of go on your next journey, but I started our high growth mid-market practice. And so I was working with companies like Vignette at the time, site stuff. There was a company I love called Yclip that unfortunately didn't have a happy ending. In your case, you end up co-founding a company that does extremely well. Can you talk a little bit about that journey from Big Four Consulting to now entrepreneur? Like a lot of your entrepreneurial audience, I'm sure it didn't happen as planned. And I basically had to make it work. So the short version is After EY, I went to work for a dot-com to go uh, live the dot-com dream. I passed on an investment in Vignette when it was early on, and I went from $2 to $100. Then, of course, it came back down to $2. I worked for a dot-com that had about an 18-month life, and we went belly up. And uh, I had a new baby and a new wife, and I had no way to make ends meet in a tough economy. So I started consulting to make ends meet. So that's really how I actually became an, an entrepreneur. I always had entrepreneur genes and wanted to become one, but uh, at EY, I kind of got that beat out of me a little bit by the big company behemoth to make ends meet. And we had a company called the Controller Group, which turned out to be quite a successful run. But man, those early days were a lot of late nights and a lot of uh, doubts about whether you're going to make it or not. But fear motivated me for sure. Yeah. And on that topic, what would be your recommendation for those who are experiencing fear of how to break out of that vicious cycle of fear? Well, for me, it was fear of failure. And uh, again, with a new wife and a new baby, failure was not an option. I had to find ways to make ends meet. So that motivated me. It's not a great long-term strategy, however, uh, and you want to have other things that drive you. And so really the thing that drove me was at that point was success and trying to build a a better life for my my wife and, and son. And I didn't want to go back and work in the grind that is big for public accounting. So I I wanted to make it work. And while it was a lot of work and a lot of late nights and seven day work weeks, at the end, it gave me a lot of flexibility and it gave me some financial liquidity. Throughout the remainder of today's discussion, I'm kind of kind of bounce between your book and then entrepreneurship and also this whole field of hiring and staffing that you're part of. So we'll start with the book. In Who's Your Mike, you profile 11 different avatars that illustrate different aspects of the entrepreneurial journey. How did you come up with the title and what is the backstory to approaching the book through the lens of avatars? I wrote a blog about five or six years ago called Who's Your Mike? And I'll tell you that story uh, in, in just a second. But as I would share that story with people, especially entrepreneurs, I would see light bulbs go off about, wow, I didn't realize I have a mic on my own hands and what do I do about it? And so the other thing that really caused me to write that article uh, in and of itself was I got into the recruiting business 10 years ago when I bought Hire Better. I realized that most entrepreneurs, especially most really most, most companies are very reactive when it comes to hiring and they would hire whatever uh, empty seat they, they felt like they had, but no one really took a step back and took a look at their existing team to see where the challenges were, where some of their legacy employees might be causing challenges. So I wrote Who's Your Mike as a way to highlight that issue. So let me tell you that story real quick. So Mike was your fraternity brother in college, and uh, you guys were thick as thieves, best friends. You did everything together and he had your back. When you started your business in your garage a few years later, he was right there with you nights and weekends working, taking time off from his day job to help you doing all the administrative uh, back office things that you really needed done and you hated doing. As you became a real company, he quit his job, became your accountant, taught himself QuickBooks, set up your LLC, set up your bank account, all the, again, back office logistics things that you struggle with. 
And you became, uh, you, now you're a real company. You're doing five, $10 million in revenue and Mike's working hundred hour weeks and you promote him to controller and ultimately CFO to reward him for all his hard work. And uh, things are starting to fall off the rails. Now you're doing 15, $20 million in revenue. And Mike is probably over inflated title, uh, but man, he's grinding for you. Hadn't taken a vacation in five years. And you look up and Mike's trying to negotiate a $10 million line of credit with the bank and maybe negotiate a merger deal with your biggest competitor, but he's overwhelmed. He's swimming because he just doesn't know how to build a team or how to go from A to B. And so the question is, who's your Mike? Every entrepreneur has got a Mike, whether it's finance and accounting, like this example, or whether it's sales, marketing and operations, we all have employees we've outgrown. And what do we do with them? I love it because you're right. We all experience mics, regardless of the size of the organization, because no matter what stage a company is in, they are still trying to get to another level. And oftentimes what gets you to a certain point isn't going to get you to the point where you need to be in the future. So I think that the book was applicable not only to entrepreneurs, but to people in every area. And one of the topics I did want to cover is in chapter seven, you bring up resume Ralph. And I do that because we were just talking about this bigger company. And this is something I've experienced myself as I went to private equity, mid-market companies and have been a part of many startups. And that is you find this professional that looks so great on paper. A lot of times they come from this much bigger company and Although they look great, they're like a fish out of water when they come into this smaller entity. Why is that? Let me get to your question, but let me give you a bit of a back story on that. You asked me the earlier question about how I came up with the archetypes. Uh, when I kept telling the Who's Your Mike story, it, it uh, was resonating with people. And I realized there's a lot of characters like these that, that resonate with folks. And so that's why we came up with the archetype version of each character. And Resume Ralph was a, another real example. And, and all these are based on real characters, either that I've experienced directly, my, the clients that we work with. But Resume Ralph is that big swing and you know what, because a great resume for some big companies. And he or she wants to jump into the uh, startup world and get some equity. And they've heard all these great stories about how people get rich. They join one of these early stage companies and they rely on their resume. And their resume has something like Dell, which you know you worked with and, and we've worked with in the past, or HP, Apple, Facebook, whatever that big company is. And they go to a small company and it's hard. The same attributes don't carry. People, a Walmart might, might take a call from somebody from Dell or Apple, but they're not going to take a call from Higher Better or ABC Co., right? And so it becomes more of a challenge for those big company guys and gals to operate in a small company world. They're also used to having five, 10, 20 people around them to do their job for them. And so they can just lead and strategize and sit in their ivory towers. And they really are, need to roll up their sleeves and bust their hump if they're going to be working in a startup world. And the last thing I'll add is there's not an unlimited budget in startup world that there might be at you know, one of those uh, enterprise level companies. And so that often causes many challenges uh, for those guys and gals who are coming in from those big companies. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be successful in the startup world. When I'm interviewing folks or encouraging our clients to interview folks from large companies, I'm looking for some, some, uh, some relevant stories. I'm looking for somebody who maybe worked at Dell, but started up their Latin American practice or started up their, uh, you know, uh, their uh, cell phone uh, practice, which obviously went belly up. But things that were more of a startup world where they had to... Um, had to navigate. Yeah, actually, in many ways, it's kind of the reverse of the mic in your first chapter, because here you have someone who's come on to the company early on. They rise up to this title of CFO, but they don't know how to delegate. They don't know how to hand things off because they're so far in the weeds. And I think what I have seen with a lot of senior executives, having worked with many of them, is when you get to the top ranks of these Fortune 500 companies, you're kind of groomed to do more delegation, more handoffs. And I found, especially towards the end of my career in them, that bigger portions of my job were becoming handling HR issues and the politics across the company that you had to navigate. And less and less of it became about actually doing your job. And so what I found is when you would bring these very talented senior executives into these smaller companies, they had really forgotten or unlearned much of that rolling up the sleeves and just diving in and having to figure it out. 
that is just a part of being in a smaller company or startup. So it's exactly. So that's why I think at times it can be difficult to bring an entrepreneur also into a fortune 50 because they get so frustrated <laughs> at the bureaucracy of how they see things work. So it, no it's doubt. interesting. I, I think many of us are geared towards a certain stage in the life cycle of a company. And you worked at Dell, Michael Dell, you must be a very special person to go from startup to a multi-billion dollar multinational uh, company. So it's pretty rare. Hey, I, one thing I've highlighted in the book, I'd love your, your thoughts on it. I think it's true, but I'd love your perspective as a large company background. Uh, I say in that chapter that Resume Ralph, be careful for the guy or gal who baffles you with the PowerPoint. If the PowerPoint is so beautiful and laid out so perfectly, and they spent hours, if not days and weeks, putting together a PowerPoint, if they're, they're trying to baffle you with BS. Is that true? Is that something I've made up in my small company world? Or what do you think? Well, I've worked for different types of CEOs. I've worked for the type where they wanted a PowerPoint for everything. And then I've worked for the CEO where you could not bring a PowerPoint in. It was more like the Jeff Bezos where you had to have kind of a written Word document with action steps, et cetera. I kind of always preferred the latter, although I was very good at building the PowerPoints because I got used to doing it. But I think the latter step really is more focused on action than the show of the illusion of everything that's around the idea. That's one thing I liked. And I also like in the Jeff Bezos world, and I know more companies are doing it now, how he would secretly hand off the highest priorities in the company to multiple teams who had no idea that they were working on the same project. And then he would let them pursue the idea. And then he would pick which one he thought was the best idea. And I think in a lot of big companies, that's a great way to do it because you can separate these teams into almost startups, let them do their things, especially if you put them on another campus outside of the behemoth, because you'll get sucked back into it. But that would be my response. What's funny, entrepreneurs do that too, but we unwittingly do it, uh, especially for visionary entrepreneurs. We give the same project to multiple people because we forgot we gave it to somebody else and then we don't hold people accountable. So uh, uh, we struggle with our own challenges with multiple people working on projects. <laughs> it's it's the case. It happens both places. Well, one of the things I loved about the book was how you separate these avatars by intermissions. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that just rang home to me was the one on assessments. And I remember you know, it not only happened in the big Fortune 500 companies, but when I would work for these private equity groups, they would do an assessment on you as well. One of the companies who's a big private equity group right in your own backyard is known for only acquiring software companies. And then they put every single employee through an assessment. And if you don't pass the assessment, they don't hire you. I've been through DISC. I've been through Colby. I've been through, you know, I think Personal Decision International had a very extensive test that I think Corn Ferry now has probably taken hold of. But as a person in this field, what is your perspective on the importance of tests? And the other side of that would be companies relying too heavily on them. That's a great question, John. I think psychometrics do serve a purpose in hiring. My challenge is when people rely solely on the psychometrics, and if it's a pass fail, there are a lot of people, especially serving the middle market, and they're so rigid on their own archetypes, characters that they create with their psychometrics. They really encourage their clients not even to talk to anybody if they don't fit a certain specific narrow profile. That's where I have a challenge with it. If it's so black and white, pass, fail, because people aren't black and white, we're not algorithms. So they serve a purpose to get you directionally there, but they're not going to be, they shouldn't be your pass, fail. Yeah. That last test I was talking about the personal decisions international, I think it was their test. It, it wasn't, I had to do it twice. I had to do it well, actually, I had to do it three times. I had to do it twice at Lowe's because I had to do it to get a job at Lowe's. And then they were using it again to go from kind of the VP level up to the SVP, EVP level. And then I had to take it again when I went to Dell. And this is a two-day test where you're coming in and play acting for those two days. They take you through mock how you would do interviews, how you would do a client presentation, how you would handle a firing, how you would do this, do that all these different scenarios. Although I thought it was valuable, 
there's a difference between, as Iverson would say, being a practice player and being a game time player. And how you handle things in real life is going to be a little bit different than you do in practice. But out of all those tests that I took, Colby was the last one that I took and I've taken it more recently. And I actually found for me, at least, it read me the most reliably out of all of them. And Mm -hmm. interestingly, it's probably one of the quicker tests to take. So I, I will just throw that out there. We like to use them as part of how do I work with somebody? How do I understand somebody better? So if I know that John is a certain personality type, I know how to speak your language a bit versus uh, just making a higher fire decision based solely on a personality test. It's interesting. I had a manager earlier on in my career and he would use the four by four matrix. And on one side would be talent and on the other side would be culture. And he would say that a person can have all the talent in the world but they aren't a cultural fit, they're never going to close the gap. Whereas a person could have great cultural fit, but not have quite as much talent. And you can train them to get to that part. If you're not a cultural fit, it's very hard to overcome. You're right. Some of those things are ingrained or most of those things are ingrained. You're not going to change personalities. On the other front, you mentioned uh, trying to train somebody up. I think there's a lot of even startups that that adhere to that. And they're very passionate about having people grow through the ranks. And I think that's noble and some people can do it. A lot of other entrepreneurs don't have the training programs and the mentor uh, programs in in, in place. And so you're going to learn a lot of lessons the hard way. So I think there's a balance of bringing in folks who have uh, been there and done that, so to speak, have the skills and the experience, as well as having quite a few uh, up up, up and comers, future stars on your team. I agree with you. I'm going to introduce this next topic by discussing football. I think anyone who's a fan of football understands the importance of the utility player. And you see many of these players who can play multiple positions and are great on special teams. And similar to that, in many companies, we have these great Jack and Jill's of all trades. And you introduce this concept in chapter five with, I love the title, Bounce Around Betty. My question for you would be, maybe you can describe to the audience, I've kind of given a high level of what a bounce around Betty is, but who she is and how do you retain someone like Betty without losing their eagerness to learn their drive and do whatever it takes? Yeah, well, first I'll, I'll say that these characters, there's no necessarily good or bad. Each of them might be coachable and when people hear Mike, they think it's just bad. I got to get rid of Mike. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, same with Betty. So Betty in the book, uh, and there's different versions, but the version we talk about is really your right hand. And she's there early on with you when your company is trying to get off the ground. And uh, everybody has to be able to do everything in the early stage of the company. But you rely on those one or two that really are able to figure it out. Kind of like the astronaut on Mars. You have no idea what you're going to expect, but you're going to be smart enough to figure stuff out. And so that's who Betty is. So when you have a challenge in uh, in uh, customer service, you need to create your customer service engine because people are frustrated. Betty's who you go in there and start taking calls and trying to figure things out. How can we fix things on a customer service side? But as you try to next level customer service, maybe you need to replace her with somebody who's done it before. So then you send her over to your, your uh, direct to consumer, you know, having uh, trouble trying to convert all these leads that you're getting on the internet over to customers. So you need someone to come in and try to figure all that out. So she rolls up her sleeves and figures that out. Then as she solves that, now you've uh, you got supply chain issues. So she's on the next plane over to Mexico to try to figure out what's going on with your supplier and make sure that you can serve all these customers that you're now making happy. So basically she is your uh, secret agent to go solve problems, but she's not your person to build that next level department in that team. And so at some point you continue to outgrow her on in each of these departments, but she serves such a special need for the organization. So John, your question was, how do you retain her? And I, I think in some cases um, you might not want to retain her as, as you continue to grow. So what, what some companies do is they promote uh, bounce around Betty into a COO or president or some really super high executive leadership role. And they're just in over their head. So The balance is how do I uh, reward her, incentivize her, um, and and still maintain the the growth of the company by not making her my my senior leader? Well, I loved how you described it as Betty gone bad. 
<laughs> versus how do you turn it into professional betty? Yeah. But I think an issue that many companies have, because regardless of size, you do have that utility player. And I used to love them in the big companies because you could throw them in almost any task and they would take it to fruition and get the job done. But the hard thing was they eventually want to advance. And you then have to really, as you're saying, either have that hard discussion about what their limitations are, or you have to really mentor them or set them up with a coach that can help elevate them to that next level of leadership. I really enjoyed that chapter because I could relate to it. Yeah, it, it definitely comes down to your uh, your relationship with Betty and the trust and rapport that you built over the years to have that honest conversation. That's where it starts. And in many entrepreneurs' cases, and I'll I look in the mirror when I say this, I'm not going to help you get to the next level as a chief operating officer, for example, because I just don't have those skills. But I know some really smart people who could come in and coach and mentor you from the outside to help you get there, maybe with my company, but maybe set you up for your future company because I need to grow so fast. I don't have the time to deal with all the challenges that you're going to face. But if I can help you get to the next level yourself professionally uh, and help me along the way, then it's a win-win. I love the character you introduced in chapter two, which is Harry the Hustler, because anyone who's been around a sales organization is going to recognize this character because they're that person who has to be the big shot. They have all this drive. Oftentimes, more than not, they're motivated by money and they just want to conquer the world. And most of them, especially if they come up in one of these smaller firms, want to have that big chair eventually because of that drive that they have, which in itself can be a double-edged sword because oftentimes they don't have the skills, but as you point out in the book, they likely have some of the biggest customer relationships that you need to retain in order to be successful. So what are some of the real life scenarios to turn this situation around and to retain this Perry the Hustler if you have one? Yeah. Yeah. This is another one that comes down to your relationship in that foundation of trust. So uh, Harry is the kick-ass sales guy who is uh, just really making your company what it is. And as you grow and you need to build out a sales organization, sales team, Harry wants that VP of sales title. He wants to build the team and build all the infrastructure that goes along with it. Uh, but the reality is Harry is just a really, really good salesperson. Uh, he hasn't done any of those other things before. What I encourage entrepreneurs to do is maybe identify a coach for Harry, but Understand using the same psychometrics you talked about before, does Harry have the skills and the ability to become a sales leader? And sales leadership is a lot different than being a salesperson. And if he does, then maybe there's an opportunity to bring in a coach and maybe a, a consultant to help you build those sales systems and processes and structure. But Harry's just a salesperson. That's where the trick comes in. I need to really somehow incentivize and motivate Harry to be a great salesperson and still build a sales organization. I've got one story in the book related to this. It's really, really powerful. It's a client of ours who one of the co-founders was basically Harry. He was a great biz dev sales person. His partner was becoming the CEO and he wanted to become the chief revenue officer. And it took a lot of time and coaching from the outside, including myself, uh, to help this particular client. I forget what name I gave him in the book. I can't tell you his real name. To help him understand that his strength was in those relationships and sales. And frankly, that's where his passion was. And that's where his highest and best use was. It's where he was going to find his most of his joy, which I know ties to uh, the Passion Struck podcast. And we needed someone else to come in and do all the, man, systems and processes and structure and management and managing people's day-to-day -day and their CRM and all that crap. That's not for Harry the Hustler. That's for a next level sales guy. So I don't know if that answers your question, John, or not, but if you can have those open and honest conversations and help them realize what the future looks like in that other role, and it's not a fit for them, then you've got a, a real opportunity to have that conversation. Yeah, well, I'm going to use this as a jumping off point to discuss another element of this scenario. When a person like me was hired to be a senior executive in one of these companies, it wasn't because things were going smoothly. Typically, it's because things are utterly in chaos and they need someone to come in and fix them. 
In your book, you talk about putting the right people in the right roles, but you rightly bring up another element of that, which is you got to get rid of the poor performers, which is one of the most difficult things to do. Because one of the challenges I found was you're getting rid of these people who, as you termed it, were yesterday's heroes. They get these companies to a certain point. Lowe started up as a startup. And when I got there, we were still opening three, 400 stores a year and distribution centers and everything else. But we were going from this family owned company feel to being the $60 billion entity that we were. But when you are in those situations, and the same thing happened to me at Dell, these people almost have a war chest, almost like they were a war hero at one point. And so there's a lot of organizational love for them. They've done heavy lifting. They often have subject matter expertise that other people don't have. But it becomes a point where you either have to, and sometimes, push them to the side and other times get them to take a lesser role, which can be demoting them. Or if they're not going to accept those, remove them from the organization. And I think the trick here is you're dealing with that individual, but you're also dealing with the rest of the culture of the company because the way you do it has to be done in the right way. If not, you're taking this war hero and just throwing them out the door, so to speak. Yeah. So why do you think that this is such an issue for companies to deal with? And why do so many people get it wrong? Because you're dealing with human beings and those emotions and those feelings and that loyalty that they feel for those employees is real. And they also know that if you pull the trigger on a long-term legacy employee like that, you're going to cause ripples throughout the organization. And growth is hard. There's a, a saying, I'm sure you've heard, what got you here won't get you there. One of the my friends wanted me to title this book, Who Got You Here Won't Get You There, uh, because it's true in most cases that the team that got you from scrappy startup to 10, 20, 30 million dollars in revenue and getting through that hump is not necessarily the one to build five billion dollar uh, global behemoth uh, that you talked about. It's rare that anybody make that journey. Well, you know, the interesting thing on that, and I recently interviewed Gene Olwang. I'm not even sure if you know who she is, but she is the founding CEO of Virgin Unite, which is Richard Branson's philanthropic arm. And she recently came out with a book called Partnering. And one of the things that she found in many of these best companies, best philanthropic entities, best symbiotic unions of world leaders was the partnerships that they formed. And it's interesting as I look at some of these companies that have grown into behemoths, let's take Dell as an example. Michael Dell is this visible person to the world, but underneath him is a guy named Jeff Clark, who ran the whole product organization and is the vice chairman. And it was that union between the two of them, and they've both been there about the same amount of time. Maybe Michael obviously was there a little bit earlier, but Jeff has been there 25 years. But he would kind of handle and make sure that the entire product organization was working effectively and kind of handle those details that allowed Michael to do what he was great at. And a similar scenario to that is Mark Benioff and Parker Harris, where you've got Mark, who is just this brilliant marketing guy who knows how to embrace companies, come up with these new ideas, constantly push the envelope. But in the shadows, you have Parker Harris, who's been his chief technology officer the entire time. And I think it really is a strength that those types of relationships can stay together when so many don't. I'm not sure how often you've seen that in your own world. Yeah, I, well, I love it. I love the I love the stories and I love the the, the two in the box or the or the partnership concept. There's a, a comment that I make uh, in the book a couple of times, which is if I've got a leadership team of five or six people and all of us are going through this explosive growth for the first time, we're going to learn a lot of lessons the hard way. If I bring in two or three people who've done, you know, taken this journey before, then we can uh, leverage their lessons from the past to help us learn it, uh, be, be faster and more efficient. That may be the case in Dell's case. I don't know the full story. Perhaps uh, Mr. Clark was his right-hand 
man uh, along the way, but he brought in people like, I don't even remember all the names, Tom Meredith and others who, who helped bring in that expertise from the outside to help him get there faster. You can't all be doing this for the first time if you're going to grow into the multi couple of hundred million dollar company that you aspire to be. I definitely agree with that. In the case of Dell, he did have the Tom Meredith who preceded me. And when I was there, he brought in a CFO, Brian Gladden from GE. He had Dave Johnson, who he brought in from IBM, who was really an acquisition specialist and built up the whole acquisition arm. So they were very deliberate about how they did that. But I think at the core, Michael has always been fanatical about the products and producing high quality products. So having a person leading that organization that he trusted allowed him to be able to bring in these other talents, as you say, and make the whole thing work symbiotically to performing the best probably they ever have at this point. So he was fanatical about the product. And so that was the where he hung his hat. So he wanted to make sure that he had the right product person on, on his team. And so that's the, the bet he made. I know there's a company here in, in town called Tecovis who, and Paul Hedrick was fanatical about client service. So he wanted to be best practice in client service or customer service. And so I can see where you might make those bets that you're, you're best, in, best in breed, best in class in those particular areas. Absolutely. Well, I think this is a good stepping point to discuss that you describe in the book, which is company culture, which I think is extremely important right now. Because as you probably see, not only do we have the great resignation, but we have worldwide between 70 and 85% of employees disengaged. And I love how you bring up HR Rota, because my experience with HR departments throughout my career is they're kind of black and white. You have HR leaders who get it and HR leaders who don't get it. And I think you brought up the ones that typically survive are these taskmasters. But in many ways, I have found that those are the ones who are destroying the culture in many ways because they're not focusing on the heart of the company. And I recently got the opportunity to interview Claude Silver, who's the right-hand person for Gary V at VaynerX. And she is now carrying the title, the first one in the world of chief heart officer. And when I interviewed her and her story, a lot of light bulbs came on because it's really this element of having a passion struck culture in a company, meaning the employees today want to feel fulfilled about what they're doing. And not only just in the company, they want to feel fulfilled in all areas of their lives. And so the approach that she was taken there is she would talk to each employee every year and they would develop a profile for them, both of what success looks for them within the company, but what they're trying to achieve outside of it. Yet so few companies make that investment. Is that something that you feel needs to change? And what would some of your recommendations from being in the HR field yourself be on this? Yeah, it's a great question. And it does tie directly into the great resignation. We found that most people are leaving, not because necessarily of money, but because of purpose. And the pandemic has taught them they want something more out of their lives. So what you described is very typical that uh, HR departments, uh, the, the HR rotors of the world are very, very successful and very good at the tasks, the, the things that are going to get them fired if they don't do a great job. And that is things like payroll, uh, compliance with government regulations, uh, benefits and things like that. So they're really good at that. They've got to get those done or they get fired. But what a lot of entrepreneurs aspire to have is that great culture, that best place to work, that purpose and meaning. It's hard for that same person who's a taskmaster to grow into that strategic chief heart officer, as you describe, which I love the title. But I actually think it's two different roles, almost the, the, the two in a box, the partnership concept you talked about before. I think there's the basic blocking and tackling of getting those benefits and things done. But then there's the, the more strategic, greater meaning, greater purpose, a part that has to get done as well. And that part should probably be owned by the, the CEO and maybe with a chief heart officer by his or her side. And the taskmaster, maybe that belongs to the CFO because that's more of a finance and compliance related function. Or you hire a couple strong people under you who can handle those things while the person who's in the HR seat is really trying to drive 
the future culture of the company. I think there are many ways to handle it, but you're right. If you're bringing in a person to manage those things, yet you want the culture to change, it's difficult to do both unless it's a very special leader who's doing it. Because a lot of the tax masters, and I hate to put it this way, but I found them to be kind of people who read the books on how to do it, follow those guidelines, but don't venture much from them because the books on how to do the other stuff and the knowledge is not as readily available. I think could be one thing. Very true. But uh, a culture is on the top of everyone's minds these days. And the entrepreneurs who get it and follow through are going to be successful. You know, 10, 15 years ago, it was very soft and squishy, this whole culture stuff. Now you really have to take it seriously. It has to be part of who you are as an organization if you really want to be successful. Well, I wanted to ask you a couple questions about the recruiting field, since that's where you spend the vast majority of your time. And for the audience, I'll kind of let you know if you're not familiar with this world, some of the different types of models that they operate in. The most common one that you typically will see is a contingent model where the company gets paid based on making a placement. Another one is called the retainer model, and that's where some of the bigger companies, like the one you're part of, or Spencer Stewart, Corn Ferry, Hydric and Struggles, Egon Zender, play a big role. And in that one, they're kind of paid for the job overall, but it's typically done as if you'd be working for a big four consulting group. You get paid at the beginning, middle, and end. There's another area that I call the try to buy, which is where you bring the person in as a contractor and then have the right to hire them. And then the other model is I refer to as salaried, where typically you're either bringing in a hourly consultant or you've paid someone a salary internally to hire someone. Do I have it pretty well mapped out? Pretty much. Yeah. You've nailed it. And so part of the reason for that in full disclosure is because I own another company that does interim talent solutions. We do fractional placements and advisory services. And I know you do those two things and the permanent, but what do you think are some of the biggest issues right now in recruiting? Because to me, when I was both on this side, providing the services and on the other side, when I was receiving them, it seems the whole thing is a mess right now. It really is. I, before I wrote, who's your mic? I wrote an ebook called the recruiting Industry's broken that I, I'm happy to send you, uh, but it's basically geared towards the contingent model. If you had asked me this question two years ago, I would say the problem is most recruiters are just out for a commission and it's all about padding their pockets. That's generally the contingent model of recruiting where you only pay if you provide a body, which sounds good, but there's so many inherent things wrong with it. Your goals are absolutely misaligned. I love the retain model because it's more of a white glove treatment. You're identifying the the best candidate that's available in the world versus just the one that happens to be looking for a job, which is mostly the contingent model. If you ask me that today, the challenges in the recruiting world, man, it's just such a tight market right now where there's so many jobs and and not enough people to serve them. And so people are just moving so fast to try to fill these roles and beat their competition to to talent. And so I think it's just ripe for, again, bad recruiters to make a lot of money and not really provide a lot of value. And you got to move so fast. So the contingent world right now is rocking it because they're just flipping bodies left and right, but it's it's a short-term fix versus a true long-term play. The other dimension I've seen is for years, I shouldn't say years, it was a decade plus, I had relationships with all these retained search firms. And then all of a sudden, in many of the firms, all those relationships started to disappear. And there's been this big trend where they've gotten rid of a lot of the people who've come up in executive search and instead they've begun to hire operators from within the industry. And while I think there's some elements of that, which are great from a person who spent a lot of time developing those relationships with those firms, it's as if you're having to start over because you, they have absolutely no track record of who you are. And then in a lot of these, they operate by their different offices. So you have to go out and develop those relationships, not only in each office, but with multiple people in each office. It's a chore, whether you're a candidate or the company looking to hire one of these firms. Well, in the case you described, you're very people-centric and relationship-driven. And that's, I think, the history of the industry. And I think there's a big 
part of that to play. The flip side is the other side of the industry, which is all about algorithms and speed to market. And it's all about you using these psychometrics and other tests to try to, to do your recruiting for you. I, I think there's a balance. I think you leverage technology to help you build a better practice. But at the end of the day, we're human to human and H to H is our mantra versus B to C or B to B. Exactly. Well, I wanted to end the interviews by going back to the book and asking you two last questions. Towards the end of the book, you introduce Next Level Natalie. And you have this person who's now reached the point where they're looking for their operating partner. And so the question I have here are, what are the key things to consider as you embark on your relationship once you've found this operating partner? I liken it very much to your work spouse. And so take it very seriously. This is somebody who's hopefully going to be your partner, maybe not forever, but for the next two to five years, maybe not quite as seriously as you might take your spouse in dating, but, but pretty seriously. So once you identify the right person, build a relationship. Don't just go through some interviews in the office, work together, use the whiteboard and figure out how you guys work together. Go to dinner, have some drinks, get to know each other personally, because you want to make sure that you're a good fit. And then that onboarding process is so important that many of us overlook we hire somebody and say, here are the bathrooms down the, whole, down the corner and here's your laptop, let's go. And really, I think you need to create a good onboarding roadmap, a good plan, what the expectations are and what does success look like? 90 days, six months, a year, two years, what does success look like? And let's start trying to march towards that. And I like to tell people, don't expect your Natalie to make major changes for at least 90 days because you want him or her to understand the organization and how it works and how where the holes are before they start making their own assumptions of where the, the holes are. I'm going to bring the whole conversation around in a different direction. This whole time we've been talking about you're the leader and you're experiencing all these avatars on your team, but having been an advisor to many startups and on the boards of many startups, one of the things I've come to realize is sometimes the mic is the founder or the CEO. Oh boy. What happens when you're in that situation? And I know you discussed this in the appendix as kind of the next chapter when it could be the board sees that the CEO is not the right person to lead the company. And of course, if they're the founder, that's the last thing they want to give up. How often have you found that those founders actually come to that realization without being told by someone on the outside? Maybe not that they're told, but they become aware of it somehow through some peer groups or maybe just through their own self-reflection if they're a self-aware leader. It's similar to the Mike situation. Mike may be a great long-term employee that needs to be in the right role. I think many founders are the same way. They might be a great long-term part of the team, but maybe not in the CEO role. And I've seen it go good and I've seen it go bad. If you're self-aware and you can accept the chief technology officer or the, in my case, evangelist, and co-founder, I stepped aside as CEO at Hire Better a couple of years ago because I knew there were people better at that than being CEO. And frankly, I didn't really want to do that job. I want to do the, this stuff, like having podcasts with, with John. And so if you're self-aware, you can have that conversation and help somebody come to, come to that realization and step aside. Doesn't mean they're stepping down to step aside. But there's a lot of founders who have an ego and they can't accept not being the guy or the, the girl in charge. So it all comes down to their ability to, to have a assume hubris and take that step aside. Well, speaking of podcasts, I think I might've seen that you just started one yourself. I started one in the pandemic as a LinkedIn live uh, around a survive and thrive, helping CEOs uh, navigate the pandemic and be stronger on the backside. We switched it to what I called let's go uh, towards the end of the pandemic. Cause I was tired of talking about the pandemic and I wanted to encourage leaders that we can no longer point to the words pandemic. We got to figure out a way. Am I evolving that now to something around talent in the uh, workplace? Exactly what we've talked about today. Trying to decide if we call it Who's Your Mic. I don't want to have that, you know, be the name that sticks forever. But I want to talk about this concept and have entrepreneurs have a safe place to talk about the talent that they've had that works and hasn't worked and let other entrepreneurs learn from those conversations. Well, congrats on that idea. And I hope it grows immensely because. People need to hear more guidance like this, especially because retaining and hiring employees is the key to explosive growth. Well, well John, we'll have you on that podcast in the next 60 days. How's that? <laughs> it 
sounds great. I got a book coming out myself. So, oh, perfect. Perfect. Well, I did want to let the audience know, and I think Kurt does a good job introducing this at the beginning of his book, where he talks about having a lot of business books, but oftentimes we only read 20%. I will tell you, this is a very digestible read. And I think there's a persona type that any one of us can relate to. So I found this book very enjoyable to read. I laughed often when I was going through it because I had seen these exact characters throughout my career. And I would highly encourage the audience to go out and get a copy of it. It'll be in the show notes. But with that, Kurt, what are some other ways that the audience can reach you? KurtWilker.com is our current website. We're putting up a Here's Your Mic website that uh, will be here shortly. Uh, but we have a quiz. It's a fun, I call it the, uh, the team assessment for people who hate team assessments quiz. Uh, it's at, right now it's at uh, HireBetter.com slash team dash test. And it's a great uh, two minute quiz on how some of these situations that, that you might have with your own employees and maybe point you towards sections of the book that would be applicable to you. I encourage readers, you don't have to read the entire book, just read the 20% apply, that applies to you because that's what most business books are anyway. I just want to be upfront about it and tell you, hey, you know what, out of these 13 uh, you know, chapters, maybe only five really apply to you, but I think you'll find you'll resonate with all of them. Well, I would highly encourage them to read either Techno Tim or The Bounce Around Betty. Those were two of my favorite chapters. Awesome. Well, Kurt, thank you so much for being on the podcast and for becoming a first-time writer. What an accomplishment. Man, I appreciate that, John. I really do. And I love what you're doing with Passion Struck. I love that you're helping people live better lives and become better leaders. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Kurt and wanted to thank Kurt and Zilker Media for the honor and pleasure of interviewing him. Links to all things Kurt will be in the show notes. Please use the website links to purchase any of the books that you hear from our guests. The proceeds from those sales go to support the show and make it free for our listeners. Videos are on YouTube at John R. Miles, where we have over 340 videos for you to consume. Advertiser deals and discount codes are all in one convenient place at passionstruck.com slash deals. Please consider supporting those who support the show. I am John R. Miles, both on Twitter and Instagram, and you can also find me on LinkedIn. And if you want to know how I book all these amazing guests, it's because of my amazing network. Go out there and build yours before you need it. Most of the guests on the show actually not only subscribe to, but provide their suggestions for topics and guests that we have on the show. Come join us. You'll be in great company. You're about to hear a preview of my Passion Struck podcast interview with Abby Morgan, who is a playwright, author, and screenwriter. Her television work includes many, many shows, including her BBC hit, The Split. Her film writing credits include many motion pictures, including Brick Lane, The Iron Lady, Shame, The Invisible Woman, and Suffragate. And we discuss her new novel, This Is Not a pity memoir. I shut down people's hopes sometimes because it was almost too painful to hope. And I think if I was going to have that again, I would say keep that horizon as wide as you can and believe you can go as far as you can because every case is so individual and so personal that you just never know. So I certainly think when a person said that to me, I have a real conflict of emotions, you know. The fee for this show is that you share it with friends and family members when you find something useful or interesting. And if you find something interesting today about the entrepreneurial journey or just tidbits that you can take about leading any company, please share this episode with them. The greatest compliment that you can give this show is to share it with those who you care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear so you can live what you listen. And we'll see you next time. Live life passion struck.